Good morning. I'm Rashad Salamat. And I'm Doug Krisner. Here are the stories we're following today. Let's get back to NVIDIA, which is saying after I said the shares up around about 7% after the company came out with revenues for the current quarter, as a projection at least, saying that the current quarter will have revenues of $16 billion. And looking at analysts, they'd uh, really been doing the calculation of about $12.5 billion. The strong forecast, of course, fueled by surging demand for NVIDIA's artificial intelligence processors in data centers. We heard from Spear Invest founder and CEO Ivana Delevska. People were expecting that the cloud vendors will have their own solution by now. But just because of the way the generative AI wave came pretty strong, there is really no time for the cloud vendors to be coming up with their own solutions. So you're seeing everybody basically standardizing on the NVIDIA hardware. Separately, NVIDIA approved an additional $25 billion worth of stock buybacks. NVIDIA also out with second quarter revenue that doubled to $13.5 billion with uh, predictions from analysts of about $11 billion. As I said, media shares up, uh, I mean, NVIDIA shares up, oh, I think just about 7%, a little bit more than 7% in late trade. Now on to one of our top stories of the day. The founder of the Wagner mercenary group, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, was one of the passengers on a private jet. It crashed today, and Russian aviation authorities are saying everyone on board was killed. This aircraft, by the way, was on its way from Moscow to St. Petersburg. There was no immediate comment from the Kremlin on this crash. However, U.S. officials were quick to suggest Prigozhin may have faced Russian President Vladimir Putin's retribution. The crash did occur exactly two months after Prigozhin attempted a military coup on the Kremlin. Here is Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy. Both the previous episode with the Wagner Group and this episode uh, show that the Russian government and Russian intentions are increasingly uncertain. Uh, and that's a very bad thing for uh, for markets, among others. That is Terry Haynes with Pangea Policy. He went on to say the incident might be felt by both the oil and grain markets where supplies could be impacted. Rashad. Right. Let's uh, move away from the uh, geopolitics and have a look at uh, this uh, symposium coming up because traders are eyeing what uh, top economic leaders have to say when they gather tomorrow at that uh, Kansas City Fed's annual economic meet in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Here's Michael McKee. They will hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell, ECB President Christine Lagarde, Bank of England Deputy Governor Ben Broadbent, Bank of Japan Governor Kazuo Ueda is also on the agenda. The focus of the conference itself is on structural changes to the global economy. What happens when the COVID-induced economic disruptions are behind us? Do we return to the low inflation, low interest rate world before the pandemic, or do growth rates, inflation rates, and interest rates remain higher? The event begins with a dinner Thursday night, continuing through Saturday. Monday, Global Wall Street can try to figure out if there were any answers here. Michael McKee, Bloomberg, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Well, hedge funds and private equity firms are now facing some new rules on disclosure. The story from Bloomberg's Ann Cates. The Securities and Exchange Commission has adopted new policies requiring private funds to provide details about quarterly fees and expenses to investors. Plus, they are barred from charging fees to cover regulatory investigations and compliance costs unless investors agree. It is the latest effort by the SEC to tighten its grip on the fast-growing multi-trillion dollar industry, which has said the agency is overstepping its authority. In Washington, Ann Cates, Bloomberg Daybreak Asia. And we're also hearing firms will be prohibited from allowing some favored investors to cash out more easily than others unless those deals are offered to all fund investors. Rashad. All right. Chinese President Xi Jinping called on the BRICS block of emerging markets to fast track a plan to expand its membership. Let's get details now from Bloomberg's Joanne Wong. Xi told a summit in South Africa that he's glad to see growing enthusiasm from developing countries about participating in BRICS. The Chinese president's comments also come after Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi said he fully supported expanding the bloc. We hear BRICS leader will make a more detailed announcement on clearing the path for more members. That will occur before the conclusion of their annual summit in Johannesburg, which ends on Thursday. The five-nation BRICS group currently includes Russia, India and Brazil, as well as the summit's host 
West South Africa. Some 20 nations have formally applied to join the grouping, and we hear they include Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, and Egypt. In Hong Kong, I'm joined Wong Bloomberg, Day Asia. We were talking a moment ago about the rally in the U.S. equity market today. The Nasdaq composite jumping 1.6%. Now, equity market players appear to be more optimistic. The trader sentiment survey from Charles Schwab found 44% are now bullish. That's up from 32% in the second quarter. And at the same time, fewer clients think a recession here in the States is likely. 69% of Schwab's trader clients still think the economy will officially enter recession, but that's down from 86% in the prior quarter. Let's get to global news next here on Daybreak Asia. And as as we've been reporting, Russian aviation authorities are saying that Wagner mercenary group leader Yevgeny Prigozhin has been killed in a private plane crash in Russia. Let's get to Ed Baxter for more. Eddie. All right, thank you, Doug. You're right. Prigozhin, of course, the man who had threatened a coup two months ago in Russia. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lyons here. TASS, the Russian state media, is reporting that indeed it is confirmed that Prigozhin was on this plane. Of course, it had already been uh, reported uh, in Russian state media that he was on the passenger list, but they are saying that he was on board this aircraft, this jet that crashed, leaving no survivors among the three pilots or seven passengers. Now, U.S. President Joe Biden has been briefed. He spoke to reporters after being briefed on on the uh, plane crash uh, by those close to him. And he said he does not know for a fact what happened, but he is not surprised. The exact quote, I'm not surprised. And when he was asked if Putin was behind it, he said there's not much that happens in Russia that Putin is not behind, but I don't know enough to know the answer. Yeah, he says uh, this is the way that Russia works. Dueling Republican Party events tonight, GOP debate and Donald Trump with Tucker Carlson. Bloomberg's Jordan Fabian here. The path to winning the nomination is taking on Trump, but the, the political market is, is not incentivizing them to do it on the Republican side. So sure. it, it's really a tough conundrum for all of these candidates including Ron DeSantis, on the stage about how to break through and get after Donald Trump. Yeah, and then uh, the Trump Carlson. It's important to remember that this interview is pre-taped, so I wouldn't expect any live reaction to what's going on on the stage uh, with him and Tucker. But I think you would expect Donald Trump to hit Ron DeSantis, as he has done uh, for months now, and also really exhibit a general election st- strategy. Yeah, and because it's uh, pre-recorded, one wonders whether it's been edited as well. Former Trump attorney Rudy Giuliani, meanwhile, has surrendered in Georgia today, agreed to a $150,000 bond, spoke with reporters on his way out, saying D.A. Fonnie Willis will go down in history as having conducted uh, the worst investigation under the U.S. Constitution. People's First Amendment right to advocate uh, the government, to petition the government for grievances, like an election they believe was poorly conducted or falsely conducted. People have a right to believe that in America. Now, earlier in talking with reporters, when he was on his way to Georgia, he said, whether you like Trump or not, they will come after you, too. And uh, he's had his mugshot taken. I'm a big boy. I can take it. I fought battles much worse than this against people much tougher than them. Uh, So uh, he is at least hanging publicly with Trump. By the way, as I say, the mugshot has been released uh, to the media if you're interested in taking a gander. Biden administration is in talks with Venezuela to explore a temporary lifting of crippling sanctions in exchange for allowing fair elections next year. The story here from Bloomberg's Charlie Pellet. Sources say the preliminary discussions involve senior officials from both nations, including Venezuela's head of Congress, Jorge Rodriguez. Washington has floated the idea of sanctions relief to persuade the regime of President Nicolas Maduro to hold a competitive presidential vote in 2024 and free political prisoners. Sanctions have aggravated Venezuela's economic and humanitarian crisis by hindering oil sales, though they failed in their original objective of ousting Maduro. In New York, Charlie Pellet, Bloomberg Radio. All right, thank you very much, Charlie. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. In San Francisco, I'm Ed Baxter, and this is Bloomberg. Let's get to our guest. Eric Sterner is with us. He is the Chief Investment Officer at Apollon Wealth Management. He joins us uh, from Martinsville, New Jersey, right outside New York. Eric, thanks for being with us. Uh, First, your reaction to the numbers that we had after the bell from NVIDIA. Seems like another stunner. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. And yeah, no, it's uh, it's amazing. Uh, NVIDIA has uh, been at the center of this AI frenzy and 
that's what's really driven the market this year, and they continue to just exceed expectations. And they gave uh, the, the, the markets and the bulls a shot, another shot of optimism uh, as, as the market was starting to pull back over the last few weeks. Uh, Eric, I mean, you know, you look at uh, what uh, people are, you know, look anything which has got AI is just getting a rocket put underneath it in recent months. And, you know, what are they actually pricing in? Is it, you know, all the jam coming tomorrow in effect? Well, yeah, I mean, that that's uh, with all uh, new technology or that, that could revolutionize uh, sectors, you know, the, there's always this bubble that, that builds up. And, and I think we're still at the uh, very early stages of a bubble. So I'm not, I'm not saying there's going to be a bubble burst, but we saw that, you know, going back for, the, for those of us who were around for the dot-com craze when there was that big bubble that, that, that came about. And then, of course, we had that uh, the dot-com bust um, in, in uh, 2001. So I think, you know, AI certainly, I'm not, I'm not um, uh, downgrading or, or, you know, how AI is going to change potentially a lot of industries and increase productivity. But I do, t- I do think we're starting to see a bubble build out here because we don't know who the winners are going to be. Clearly, NVIDIA is in the position to, to own it right now. Um, but a lot can change between now and you know the next few years. So in the walk-up to the uh, NVIDIA earnings, there's been this debate in the market as to whether or not NVIDIA was a more important factor than the speech we're going to get at the end of the week from uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell. How do you weigh in on uh, what's been happening in the bond market today in particular with yields uh, kind of tumbling right across the curve? We had some uh, weak PMI data, not just for the U.S., but Europe. Uh, are yields... Kind of have they topped out? Let me ask that first. I, I think they are um, starting to top out. Uh, we, we've seen uh, the economy continue to grow, even with all these rapid uh, series of rate hikes. And even I know the Atlanta um, uh, Fed had, had predicted GDP to be 5.8% in the third quarter, which I don't think anyone really believes is going to be that optimistic. Uh, but I, we, we're seeing you know, many mixed signals with the economy, and, and I do think you know, the economy is starting to con- contract, so I do think yields will, will start to come down. Um, you know, as far as the news this week coming out of uh, Jackson Hole, I, I don't expect any big news other than Powell reiterating what he has told us, that inflation, yes, we are making progress, but we still have a long ways to go. And I think we're going to stay um, with restrictive rates over us for – uh, probably up until at, at the best, but I don't think we're going to see any cuts until the second half of 2024. And I'm sure Powell's going to leave the door open for uh, another rate or potentially two more uh, rate hikes in the coming months, depending upon how the data comes in. Yeah, absolutely. You make a very interesting point here that uh, the uh, in the Fed's history, the market, it's only cut rates six times when unemployment was below 4%. Exactly. Exactly. I, I think. I mean, because the economy is doing well, it, what, what there is just giving more room for the Fed to maintain these restrictive rate levels. So I just don't see the Fed seeing any reason to to cut rates right now because uh, we. I, I think there's high expectations in the markets that we're, the inflation is going to be bumpy, and we've seen increased energy prices. We've seen. Uh, continue to see high wage growth. It's yes, it's slowing down, but still higher than the Fed wants to see because of the tight labor market. And of course, with the uh, with Russia exiting the uh, Black Sea Grain Initiative, that's going to keep um, uh, some uh, inflation pressure on food prices. So, w- with all that in mind, I, I don't see the Fed have any uh, has any near term intentions of cutting rates uh, this year, and, and probably not until the not second half of 2024 at best. One of our stories today is how global investors have been shedding the big blue chip names in China during the longest stretch of outflows on record. Very quickly, Eric, would you be long the Chinese market given that we have seen just stunning punishment of asset prices right now? Maybe now is a buying opportunity. Yeah, in, in the long run, absolutely. I, I think in the short run, uh, term, I, I think we could still see some more downside there uh, with China. But we know that's number two uh, global uh, economy. So, so yes, if, if you're looking years out and want to have a long-term play, I think it's a great time to buy. Uh, but I do think they have many issues there um, and, and the aging demographics, high youth unemployment that they need to straighten out. 
Um, and, and they're still trying to transition from a nation that depended upon exports to more uh, consumer spending. And that's going to take some time. So I, I do expect some more short-term pain in mm-hmm. China uh, over the next year or so. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Asia, your morning brief on the stories making news from Hong Kong to Singapore and Wall Street. Look for us on your podcast feed every day on Apple, Spotify and anywhere else you get your podcast. You can also listen live each day on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM Channel 119, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Doug Krisner. And I'm Rashad Salamat. Join us again tomorrow for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Asia.